This morning, we're going to talk about the art of war. Fun. An ancient Chinese uh, military book, actually, piece of literature written by Sun Tzu, uh, believed to have been written sometime around the time of 475 and 221 B.C., it's an old book. You can buy currently still today. It's been translated and republished over and over. Who would have thought probably, what, over 2,000 years ago, a Chinese guy would have his book published by Barnes & Noble Publishing, but he does. And um, yeah, so in the book, The Art of War, it's a military piece of literature written to military leaders and it gives advice on when and how to fight. And here's just a few of the ma main points taken from it. It's a, not a crazy long book, but here's just a few points taken from it. The first is appear weak when you're strong and strong when you're weak. Another point that he says in it is if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you also suffer defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Another point in his lit piece of literature is that the art of war teaches you to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy coming. Rather, it teaches you to ready yourself to receive the enemy. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12 this morning. Turn in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is a great chapter for us. It's a look into the enemy's war tactic. And it also provides us with an example of how to be ready to receive the accuser. In Revelation 12, we see a supernatural cosmic war of the past and a war that will come in the future. And from these two things, we can infer how Satan devises his present war strategy today. So turn to Revelation chapter 12 in your Bibles. A lot of the um, words will come up on your screen, but it's always good to have a Bible in your hand to take notes and jot stuff down. And as you guys go there and get there, if you don't know, it's the last book of the Bible. Easy to find. Turn to the last page and back a few pages. And I'm going to open up some prayer this morning. Lord, thank you um, just for your word. Thank you um, that we need you, Lord, and you came for us, Lord, that you knew that we needed you, Lord. Father, you sent your son to die for us on the cross, uh, to shed his blood, to willingly give up his spirit for us, and in that we can rejoice this morning, Father. Thank you for that, that we have uh, great joy this morning as we read your word. So, Lord, um, just help us this morning get insight into the tactics and war strategies of the enemy, Lord. Give us uh, plans and tactics to defend against the battles that we have against the enemy. And so just bless this time this morning. Amen. Amen. So the book of Revelation, a great book of the Bible to many of us. The book of Revelation is a bit of a scary book. Does anyone agree? You kind of go through your reading and you think, oh, I'll do Revelation after... Matthew. Oh, I really want to do Ephesians. I'll do Revelation later when I, in my reading. It's one that we leave to scholars and people that have too much time on their hands to sit and read and interpret, but it can be understood plainly, I promise you. In the last chapter of Revelation, uh, John's told not to seal up the words of this prophecy, which tells us this is meant to be understood. It's meant to be known and understood what God showed John here. And so here in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, John is having a vision and he's writing the things that he's seen, the things that are, and the things that are going to come. And so let's see what John sees here in verse 1 to 2. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. So over the next six verses here in the first bit of chapter 12, we're going to be introduced to three different characters described in symbolic language. The first we see here is a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and 12 stars crowned on her head, and she's crying out in birthing pains. And who is this woman? Well, using your Bible skills that I know you have, you know when something is odd like this, kind of weird, you're like, what is this? 
implying to you. You look at context clues above and after the verse maybe to see if there's any context that gives us to who this uh, woman is. And while when we look at it here, it doesn't really help us in this case. So the next thing we do is we look um, for other places in the Bible where there might be the same wording, uniqueness in this to help us give us a clue of who this woman is with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And so does anyone know where else in the Bible, the only other place in the Bible we see the sun, the moon, and the stars together? Joseph nailed it. Joseph, Joseph's vision, the story of Joseph, the one with the coat of many colors. In the book of Genesis, um, and, and when you go there, you look at his vision. We're not going to go there this morning, but you, so you just have to trust me. You can go there later, maybe. Look at the vision that he has, and you'll see that, that he's talking about the nation of Israel in reference to the sun, the moon, and the stars. And we know that in the book of Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, they refer to Israel as being a woman uh, experiencing birthing pains. Often the hardship of of Israel enduring is related to a woman experience birthing pain. So from all these context clues of other parts of the Bible, we can safely assume this woman here is the nation of Israel that John is seeing. This great sign that John is seeing is the nation of Israel. So let's keep going, verse 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So the next introduction we get here is a great red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems, or crowns, like we normal people say. And the dragon stands before the woman about to give birth, so that he might devour the child. So now who's this dragon? Well... We don't need to go too far along in our context clues. Whoa, 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 get that dragon off the screen. <laughs> Easy there, chief. Settle down back there. <laughs> oh, what is he doing? Look away. Shade your eyes. No, look away. Get through. Next. This guy. He's, that's it. Sermon's over. We're going to have to call it a day. It's been great seeing you all. Uh, no, just kidding. Now, this dragon... So we know this dragon is who? Who do we know this dragon is as we go farther along? Satan, yes. We see in verse 9 that the dragon is referred to as Satan, the serpent, the devil. And so remember, this dragon is a symbol. It's a sign of the moral pickups of Satan. It's not literally the physical description of what Satan looks like. But this can get dangerous, can't it? When we undersell the ferocity of the devil, because often we like to think the devil looks like... (laughs) There he is. (laughs) We get these visions in our head of seven-headed dragon toys, and we have visions of... Derpy-looking dragons. Ghidorah. There you go. Who's next? And then we got the, the picture of Satan dressed up in a nice little suit. And, and we can get this in our head. And we paint pictures like this of, of just, and we just dismiss the devil as not real. Well, this is just a cartoon. This is what the devil looks like. He can't be real. Simply cartoon children's toys. You know, C.S. Lewis says this in the Screwtape Letters, which will come up on your screen. He's speaking as Uncle Screwtape to his nephew, Wormwood. Um, Screwtape says, it's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their mind. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. The number one way the devil wants you to think about him is to not think about him at all. But rest assured, friends, Satan is real and he is mighty and he is powerful like a great red dragon that we see here in the book of Revelation. He is far older. He's much wiser Then all of us here, I promise you that, as wise as you might think you are, he was able to convince a third of the angels to rebel against God and join him, as we see in verse 4, as the tail swept a third of the stars down. Jesus tells us in the book of John that Satan was crafty and subtle in his deceit to Eve. Jesus tells us that Satan is a murderer and his native language is lying. 
Peter tells us that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Paul tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. You see, friends, Satan has power in this world that we live in. But the key here is the word prince, because there's only one king. Amen? We'll get to that in a minute, though. Friends, Satan is a real force to be reckoned with. He's a real enemy. He isn't a figment of my imagination. He isn't just these pictures we see on the screen. He isn't the devil that sits on a lonely highway waiting for vagabonds to come through and challenge them to fiddle, fiddle offs. I don't know what you call that. Fiddle duel for their soul. It isn't a case of the likelihood of whether he will wage war against you or not. Fellow Christians, I know you all here. I know you are strong, believing Christians. You're regular in prayer. You're regular in your Bible reading. I know you regularly witness to other people. I know you enjoy fellowship as we eat my half-made sandwiches back there together. Friends, the enemy will attack you. I guarantee you this. Let's take a look at how he waged war in the past. Let's look again at the second half of verse 4 through to verse 6. It says this, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So our third character John sees here is a male child, one who, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron and who was caught up to be with God on his throne. And we all know that is Christ Jesus. The proto-evangelum, the first gospel, Eve is deceived by the serpent, takes a bite of the fruit, passes it over to her husband. He takes a bite of the fruit. And as they're hiding in their shame, God comes and addresses the issue at hand. And he looks to the serpent and he says this in Genesis chapter 3. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so we know that one coming is Jesus Christ here. And from this point on that we see in the Proto-Evangelum, the first gospel in the book of Genesis, Satan had one goal in mind. From that point on, destroy the one who will be the head crusher, which is the male born through the nation of Israel. And we see this played out in many ways in history, don't we? And I'm just going to give you some quick examples, some very obvious ones. The book of Exodus uh, Pharaoh wants every Hebrew male born to be killed. The book of Esther, there's a guy by the name of Haman who seeks to have all the Jews killed. Uh, in the New Testament, when Jesus is born, we have Herod who says every male baby under the age of two that's born in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas is to be killed. When Jesus is in the wilderness for 40, 40 days, and the Satan comes to tempt him and says, jump off this cliff and the angels will save you. Or bow to, my, bow to me and, and I'll give you everything you want. Those are just, those are meant, there's many more if we get into it. But those are just some of the most obvious examples of Satan having a goal in mind to kill the snake crusher. You know, there's one time in history that I know of where Satan and God are in complete agreement. And that's when Jesus is walking down the Via Della Rosa with a cross on his back after being beaten, after being scorned, after having a crown of thorns put on his head. He walks to, through the city to Golgotha where he was hung up on a cross and crucified. And the moment that Jesus willingly gave up his life, Satan and God were in complete agreement. Satan thought he'd finally won after all these thousands of years of attempting to destroy the one who was prophesied would destroy him, the snake crusher. It's finally happened. It's party time for Satan and his boys. But three days later, friends, three days later, the father took what the enemy meant for evil and he turned it to good. As Jesus walked out of the tomb, he left the burial clothes behind and Jesus defeated the one thing that Satan had left, which was death eternal separation from God. 
And Jesus, being the bloodshed lamb, once and for all, took away any power that Satan had. And so with that merciful act performed by Jesus on the cross, willingly giving up his spirit, Satan's war tactic needed to change. Up till this point, his goal was, we're gonna, I'm just going to destroy the one who's been prophesied to destroy me, and then we're good, and I'm all good, and I can continue on being the prince of the power of the air. But at that point, his tactic needed to change. His war tactic needed to change. He realized, okay, the war has been won by Jesus, but the battle isn't over. And Satan realizes, hey, if I'm going down, I'm bringing all you guys down with me. I'm going to bring down as many with me as I can. Look at verse 7. Now, verse 7, we see a vision of the future war that is to come. This is what John sees in verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his, and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So at this point in verse 7 of Revelation 12, we're catapulted in the future. And this vision, vision that John sees is taking place during the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, the tribulation period split into two equal three and a half year periods, two halves. The first half of the tribulation period consisting of the seven seals being opened and crazy things happen, and then seven trumps, trumpets blow, and each one crazy things happen. I'm telling you, go home and read chapter six to nine today, because it's awesome, but frightening at the same time. And so all this crazy stuff happens, and then after three and a half years, 1260 days, this war takes place in heaven, and Michael and his angels versus Satan and his angels in the ultimate tag team pay-per-view match goes on in heaven. Now, Satan in heaven, what's that all about? You might be wondering, because that's what I wonder. Satan in heaven. I didn't know Satan could go into heaven. Well, he is. And here it is, saying he's accusing the brethren both day and night. End of verse 10 says that all day, every day, Satan is in court as the crown prosecutor accusing the brethren before God until eventually Michael and his angels banish him and his minions to earth. Now, why Michael? Why is Michael the one doing the fighting here? Well, because this needs to be clear to all of us. Satan is not the opposite of God. Understand this, that Satan is a created being. He is not omnipotent, he is not omniscient, he is not omnipresent. Just about missed that last O. Satan is but a small fly to the one who by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Satan is but a blip to the power of God. Know that Satan is not the opposite to God. So Satan will get kicked out of heaven where he'll then direct all his attention here on earth. And so this future supernatural war gives us insight into Satan's battle plan today. See, the moment Jesus walked out of that tomb, friends, Satan had to change his tactic. His tactic changed from destroying the snake crusher to trying to make sure you don't know about him and you don't think that you can come to him. He is right now in heaven accusing you both day and night until this moment right here in verse 7 in the tribulation period when Michael and his boys kick him out of heaven. And these accusations being hurled in heaven spill over into our lives today, don't they? 
As Satan is in heaven accusing you to God, his demons are on earth here following the leadership and instruction of their man in charge, Satan. They're saying you're not good enough. They're saying you didn't read your Bible. They're saying, you know, God saw what you looked at last night laid on the internet. You know, they're saying good husbands and wives don't fight like you two do. The devil and his minions, they wage war by tossing up accusations that are subtle and cunning. Their accusations undermine the validity of the Bible. Their accusations make you think prayer isn't effective. They cut you off from fellowship. They don't want you coming to church. They stop your witnessing to other people. Look at verse 11. We know how the enemy wages war. Now let's look at how we're to respond, how the saints respond. Verse 11 And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. The three keys to victory over Satan. Though these refer specifically to the saints during this mid-tribulation period, it is the same tactic that Satan uses today. And so we can apply these three keys to victory in our own lives. The first key is the blood of the Lamb. As Satan sits on the prosecutor's seat, violently accusing every person who comes into the room, Jesus has but one thing to do, present the evidence of his blood to his father, the blood that washes you whiter than snow. The blood that Paul says in Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The blood of the lamb is proof that we have a substitutionary sacrifice in our place who died for us. Our number one weapon in this war against the devil is the blood of the lamb. I heard you guys are a fan of Spurgeon quotes, so I've got a quote from Spurgeon here for you who can say it much better than I ever could. The precious blood of Jesus is not meant for us merely to admire and exhibit. We must not be content to talk about it and extol it and do nothing with it, but we are to use it in the great crusade against unholiness and unrighteousness till it is said of us, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. This precious blood is to be used for overcoming and consequently for holy warfare. We dishonor it if we do not use it to that end. The dog of hell knows the dread name which makes him lie down. We must confront him with the authority and especially with the atonement of the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. Let's look at the second key that we have to victory here over the devil. That's the word of their testimony chapter 12, verse 11. You have a story, friends. You have a personal story of the goodness of Jesus. You have a testimony of your need for Jesus. Every time you share God's faithfulness, you are a witness to the fact that he will do it again. By the word of your witness of the faithfulness of Jesus, you cannot be deceived by the accusations of the devil. And more than that, friends, I encourage you, When others hear of the faithfulness of God in your lives, it spurs them on towards love and good deeds. Let's look at the third key to victory we see here in chapter 12. They love not their lives, even unto death. In the book of Philippians 1.21, it says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Loyalty is to spiritual life over your physical body is something that, to be honest, we don't really have to choose between here and Canada. It could come in our life. It could come in our children's lives. It could come farther down the generations here in Canada. But right now, we have it pretty good here in Canada. I I don't really know when it'll come, but choosing between God and our physical lives right now isn't something we have to deal with. But friends, I ensure you especially after um, we had Edward here before Christmas. There are people in the world today that are choosing God over their physical tent of a body. 
the will to live in a human body is very strong, as I'm sure a lot of you might know if you've been around death at all. The physical body has a will to live that is makes it able to do things that I didn't even realize could do. The effort that the body puts in to keep blood pumping is pretty amazing. But friends, don't put your hope in flesh and blood. As far as I can tell, other than a couple guys in the Bible, 10 out of 10 people die. It's a true fact. I don't know anybody nowadays that hasn't... Well, I caught myself, didn't I, there? Got myself in a little word mix up there. Good fact for you, 10 out of 10 people die. Let's just go with that. Friends, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's keep going right to the end here of chapter 12 and look at verse 12. Chapter 12, verse 12 of Revelation. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who'd given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the stand of the sea. So here we see Satan cast out of heaven, locked out of heaven halfway through the tribulation period, and he comes to the earth in great wrath because he knows his time is short. At this point, Friends, the seven bowl judgments are going to be poured out upon the earth, and it is not good because you got the wrath of God coming on the earth. You got the wrath of Satan on the earth, and let's just say you don't want to really be around at that point. And Satan knows that his time is short, and he pursues Israel, but God hides a select away. Verse 17, the dragon becomes furious. And who does he go after when he realizes he can't go after the woman anymore? He goes to make war on those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. The art of war, you need to know your enemy. You need to know the enemy is coming and be prepared to receive him. Those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus will be engaged in war. In fact, friends, I would implore you, if Satan is leaving you alone and not accusing you, it's time to be scared. That's when you should be scared because it means he knows that you're not a threat. He goes, that one's good. Like Uncle Screwtape said, we'll just stay out of their brain. The less we put in their brain, the better. But when you're under accusation, remember these three keys to victory, the blood of the lamb, the word of your testimony, and love not your life even unto death. The best tactic when under accusation is to say, yes, I agree, you're right, I am a sinner. Those things that you're accusing me of aren't even, ha- if you knew all of what, you're, what you could potentially accuse me of, I'd be done for. You agree with the devil, and then you point to the blood of the lamb. You point the devil to Jesus Christ who's washed away your sins. The war is already over if you're on team Jesus. Remember the things that Jesus has done for you in your life, your testimony of, your, of the goodness of God in your life. And if you love not your life even unto death, then the devil is merely a toothless, sweet little baby, a dog that's all bite and no bark. All he can do is simply make himself appear strong when he is weak. And all you have to do is be weak because when you are weak, 
then you are strong.